Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to the third and final public forum for MAP in 2013. Uh, my name is Rowan Workman, I'm the MAP manager. And thanks for coming down on what's a pretty good spring afternoon. Uh, there's a bit of an aura around venture capital and deals and all, those, all of those sorts of things, especially for students and those getting into the startup community. In the past, we've had events around MAP that look at um, entrepreneurs and investors and how to pitch and how a term sheet might work. But what we thought we'd do tonight is actually sit down and go through a venture capital deal and try and unwrap a bit of the mystery that's around that and hopefully you can take away some insights into what it actually takes to raise venture capital, what's involved, the good, the bad and the ugly. Fortunately for us, we had one-to-one -one cast and another couple of companies went through MAP last year that raised some capital at the conclusion of the program. One-to-one -one cast raised $250,000 from the Optus Innovate Seed program and also Adventure Capital. So tonight I have with me on stage Ed Hooper from One to One Cast, one of the co-founders, and also Stuart Richardson, who is the managing partner of Adventure Capital. So what we thought we'd do tonight is have a bit of a conversation around how the whole deal unfolded from meeting each other to signing the term sheet and signing the deal and then moving on, and what is happening now for One to One Cast. So uh, the format will have a bit of a discussion up here. And later on, we will open up to questions from the audience. So if you do have a question, keep it in mind. We've got a couple of microphones that will be going around. Just wait for the microphone to get to you and then ask your question so we can capture the audio for what is obviously being recorded and will go on the MAP YouTube channel. So would you please join with me in welcoming Ed and Stu. I thought we'd start off by getting Ed and Stu just to have a bit of a chat and, uh, about their background and how they came to be involved in what they're doing. So Stu, do you want to kick us off and tell us how you came to be the managing partner of Adventure Capital and what Adventure Capital does? Okay, so I'll uh, try and keep this as short as possible because like most entrepreneurial journeys, it's not a, a direct and straightforward one. Um, very quickly, I had a little boy dream to be a pilot in the Australian uh, Air Force. Uh, I pursued that uh, dream vigorously and uh, managed to get into the Australian Defence Force Academy in the Air Force, studied aerospace engineering there, but got injured, which meant that uh, my little boy dream was going to, uh, to disappear. Ultimately ended up being medically discharged from the military, but uh, too young and too dumb to know any better, managed to uh, start my own consulting company because I guess that's what you do at age 22 because you know everything. Um, that was an advantage, I guess, because I, uh, I guess I didn't know what I didn't know, but I, uh, I had the confidence to actually pursue that. So that company was extremely successful, uh, grew triple digits year on year for seven years straight. Um, but as I, I guess, navigated that journey, what I found was that uh, the company was delivering amazing projects, but wasn't delivering what I felt to be sustainable value. Um, sustainable value is, uh, or the way that I uh, term that, was that we were delivering projects and capability and assets uh, into service, but we felt that the value creation ceased as we handed them over. Um, and I guess the, the cure that I found or, or identified was that, uh, that I should take an, a, a slice of the asset uh, ongoing. And, uh, and that's really where the, the, the journey from consulting in high stakes and complex projects into venture capital really started. So I took a sabbatical in 2009. I studied at Stanford. I did the Stanford Executive Program. And then since returning from Stanford, uh, I've basically been working on the entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, of which essentially things like Silicon Beach, uh, Startup Weekend across Australia, uh, the York Butter Factory, uh, Aurelius Digital, and uh, and I guess as the centrepiece, Adventure Capital uh, sits. So we've got a partnership which spans both here in Australia but also across into the Silicon Valley. Uh, one of our uh, venture partners and chairman is uh, a co-founder of a small company called DoubleClick, which you see represented quite strongly still on Google's balance sheet. Um, and I guess we have, uh, yeah, I guess a fantastic portfolio of companies, including uh, including one to one cast. But uh, I think enough of my story, and more uh, more onto Ed's. Thanks, Stu. Um, yes, yeah, so I was a student here from 2004 to 2008. I did computer science and information systems. So I was an engineering and science student. Um, during school, worked at Microsoft part time, kind of doing some marketing stuff, which is really cool. 
And then we've long, my current co-founder now, um, we did our own startup in 2008, which is about sustainable farming. So we essentially put um, sensors, I guess, all over a farm. It would bring in all the data and then put that on Google Maps and you could kind of see what was happening on the farm. Uh, we found out that raising money for a really good idea during the GFC was not the best time to be doing it, but we uh, learned quite a bit, which is good. Um, after that, worked at ANZ Bank and did their iPhone app, which went pretty well. We got a million downloads and we're the top rated financial app. Um, did, uh, went to the US and did a program at Stanford like Stu, but uh, also at the business school, but I guess more, I guess it was a program for like people that hadn't done business but wanted to pick up things. It was kind of an accelerated program. Came back from that, did Groupon and kind of did more of a strategy role. And then, yeah, decided, no, I need to do another startup. Uh, Long called me up and he had this idea and we just couldn't stop thinking about it. So we quit our jobs and then kind of went down this startup path. What was the idea? Personalized radio. So basically we were trying to consume information whilst getting to work. We found that for decades people have used the radio to discover new music, to find out news, to find out weather, to you know, listen to radio personalities and get all these updates. And there's just all this great information. The problem is the radio station goes, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna get all of Melbourne or all of Australia and we're going to come up with what's the best for everyone across that region. And we didn't want that. We wanted, you know, what was the best for us. So I'm a tech guy. I want the tech news. I want, I don't know, like house music or the top 40 or something, not, say, country or rock. And just, you know, I guess we've come up with this app where you pick the pieces you want and then it puts it all together and makes this radio station that's about you and it learns based off what's going on around you, what you're listening to. And, uh, yeah, it's coming out in about a week. Where can you find it? Uh, omniapp.com, you can put your email and you'll get told when it's out. Fantastic. Got to give it a plug since we asked yep. Ed to come along. Um, so you had the idea with Long. You had this brainstorming. So you, I remember you got a phone call from Long. You sat down. You put it together a one-pager, didn't you, on what you thought the idea would, could, could be, who the competitors were, how you might get it to market, what it might look like. What did you do after that? Yeah, so Long, Long's called me, has had this idea. We get ideas all the time, but unfortunately all of them are really bad and or other people have done them. So whenever I get an idea, I quickly kind of make a mini business plan. Like, is anyone else doing this? Who would the competitors be? Who are we displacing by kind of bringing this to market? What would we need to actually, to actually build it? So kind of put this, put this together and this one, um, everything seemed to check out and we we're pretty excited. So I started looking at, all right, who are the, who are the VC players uh, in Australia? You know, who can we go in and speak to about money? And Long and I had met a few of them in 2008 from doing that other, I guess, startup. And so I typed in venture capital and, and Stuart came up and I saw, oh, okay, he's done a Stanford program, so have I, cool, I can play that card. And so I just sent Stu a message and I was, I was living in Sydney at the time, but I was gonna be coming to Melbourne, so I said, oh, hey, um, you know, I'd love to have a chat with you and just find out what you're doing and just also, you know, find out how you found Stanford and I'm really interested in startups, you know, I, I've, I've done one myself and would just love to have a chat. Because we found that, I guess, when you, when you speak to these guys, you can't just, it's best not to just show up and expect a check right away. We wanted to kind of just get some feedback and find out if some venture capitalists actually kind of thought this would be a good idea or not before we, you know, quit our jobs to do it. I guess that's uh, one of the things I'd like to touch on a bit more and that <clears throat> a lot of startups may want to raise venture capital, not knowing full well what it could mean, but also how do you find them and how do you approach them? And you said you had a couple of connections already into venture capitalists from doing the, the startup with the Microsoft Imagine Cup. But for people in the room who may not have personal relationships with investors, you know what you just found, Ed, with Stu on the internet, you, you sent him an email. Yeah, LinkedIn. And I mean, how, if you weren't already a little bit connected, if you hadn't done the Stanford program, how would you frame that email? How would you get in touch with someone like Stu? Would you send them a blue email, um, email out of the blue? So in terms of finding them, I, like we, we get great success from, find, if we want to do something, finding people who have done it and done it well. So I'd be searching in the media just seeing which startups in Australia over the last few years have, have raised money. Mm -hmm. and I guess also who are successful founders that have done well that would now have money. So people like say Paul Bassett, the guy that, you know, one of the guys that did Seek. Mm -hmm. And in a few years, hopefully like the Atlassian guys or the freelancer guys will, you know, be, be following on and doing that kind of stuff. Later this year for uh, freelancer, I yeah. list. Um, so right. yeah, fi I guess find, um, off those other companies who have raised, you can find, okay, here, here are other startups in Australia. They've been invested in by, um, either US investors or they've been invest they've, they've they've gotten funding from investors who are willing to put into Australian companies. So that means that they'll, you know, 
be likely to do your company if you're in Australia. Mm -hmm. And then try and find, you know, what, what do they look for? There's usually good information on their website. Put their name into LinkedIn. Is there anyone you know who knows them? Is there, um, is there anything you have in common? If not, try and find someone at one of their companies. So if you, know, if you want an intro to, to Stu and you want to impress in venture capital, finding a portfolio company that he you know, kind of trusts in mm -hmm. and getting our advice on your idea. Like if we're gonna forward you, then you've got our, our stamp of approval, that's gonna add a lot of credibility. So I'd be targeting those other companies that have already got investment, making sure you're you know, ready before you go and pitch. Okay. In that case, and Stu, you must get a lot of emails out of the blue. How do you decide to take his meeting? I think it's the uh, the connection sort of side of things, like that. Uh, I guess Ed was able to, I guess, you know, demonstrate a level of empathy. So we had connections in terms of Stanford. We had connections in terms of startups. His profile, when I essentially did a very quick check to sort of, you know, to do the background to say, where's he from? What's he done? Who's he connected to? Those types of things, you know, were were definitely, I guess, signals. Um, what his email said was also very, very important in terms of the, the, the selection as, as to whether or not I wanted to, uh, to, I guess, take that next step. To give you some context, we probably receive, you know, uh, three to five deals a day in terms of people wanting money, uh, and I probably get five to ten sort of uh, LinkedIn requests a day as well. So, you know, if you've got basically just a straight through LinkedIn request which has no more information than the request to, to connect, chances are the ignore button is going to get worn out pretty quickly. Um, in terms of just coming back to a couple of points that, that Ed probably skipped over, um, the discipline that I think Ed and the team sort of, uh, I guess, applied to go through their idea and actually do a triage process and do the mini business plan, I think, is a fantastic discipline uh, that every entrepreneur should think about. Uh, entrepreneurship is uh, is a long journey. It's a marathon. It's not a hundred meter sprint. So if you want to line up on the hundred meter start line, chances are you're going to make the finish line. No problems. That's you know twenty seconds, ten seconds, whatever it happens to be. But if you want to do a marathon, it's going to take practice. You're going to need to start small. Start to actually introduce those disciplines, basic disciplines around essentially how do you how do you assess the market, and you need to practice those skills. Um, so building up those, those frames in your own mind, those skills in your own uh, repertoire are critically important if you want to be able to actually, I guess, play an A game going forward. Um, if you want to be the best, you need to, to essentially emulate the best. So I think Ed made a good point there. Have a look around, do your research, understand the investor that you're approaching uh, and try and hit, you know, find some key points. And the best way to actually get introductions to investors is not to actually ask directly for money, but actually get an introduction and, uh, and I guess, get some level of uh, credibility associated with that introduction. So I guess as an example, if Ed thinks it's a good idea and he comes to me and says, this is a fantastic idea, you should take this, take this opportunity, you should meet this person, I think you could add, add value, that comes with it an enormous amount of, I guess, uh, support. And, and it'll get our attention. So I guess that's the, that, that's, that's, that's the key pieces that I'd think about as you start to think through the need for venture capital. The other thing is, is that venture capital comes with hooks, but I think we're going to, to explore that more. Oh, we will. Um, so when was that first meeting and uh, what was discussed? Look, uh, so I guess the initial sort of connection was actually made through my business partner, Darcy Norton. So there was a, there was a meeting between uh, Ed and Long, I believe, uh, and Darcy. And uh, I, must, I must admit, I didn't really know a huge amount about it. And uh, it was in approximately February uh, of last year. Feb last year. Yeah. February of last year at the York Butter Factory. So uh, you know, we, it was an initial meeting whereby essentially they had a, uh, for me, a pitch deck. Uh, and at that stage, the, the business from my memory was called Loku. Um, and what I was really impressed uh, with was effectively that the, um, the passion of the guys as to essentially the problem that they were looking to solve. So they, weren't, they didn't come up with an amazing technology and then they were looking for, a, for essentially a home for that technology um, or looking for a problem to solve. They actually had a problem to solve and they were working to actually develop out the solution and they had the, the building blocks to, to achieve that. So, so I guess first impressions really do count um, and I guess the, the best way to essentially come at things is to, to, to start with a problem and work out the best way to, to solve it um, as, a, as, a, as a framework. 
rather than coming up with, a, with an awesome idea and then looking for a home for that awesome idea to create value. Okay. And Ed, what was included in that pitch deck? Uh, it was about 10 slides. It would have been, I guess, a cover slide, what the, what the problem was that we were facing, what the solution was, uh, some, I guess, some traction we'd already had. So over the week, we spoke to some people and got some testimonials, and you know, we spoke to like 30 people, 25 said they thought it was a problem. A uh, slide about the team and what we'd done. A slide about um, how much money we'd think we needed to get this off the ground. Another slide. Uh, how did you come to that figure? Was it just a pick it out of the air type figure, or? Um, it, it was basically what would get us through like the next year, and when we thought we could get the product to market. And it was um, a very, I guess, <coughs> modest salary for myself and Long, and then some other kind of like server costs and tools and licensing, that kind of stuff. And basically we, yeah, we made this mini business plan and then we had a phone call each night for a week because I was in Sydney at the time and he was in Melbourne. And each night after work, we basically iterated on that and would, would have a go separately and then kind of combine. And then we had, yeah, who possible acquisitions could be, although we did think it could be a pretty big, I guess, standalone company. And then we had some, kind of some next steps. And I guess a lot of the, the elements that we came up with in that plan are still, I guess, relevant, relevant today. And for a, what we did in a week, it was pretty accurate. Okay, and what was the next step after that initial meeting? Uh, I guess with the initial meeting, we, uh, we, we essentially, uh, I guess, looked at um, Loku as it was then. Uh, as a candidate for Aurelius Digital. So that was actually the way it ended up being referred in and, uh, and I guess initially assessed when I had a look at it. So Can you just describe what Aurelius Digital is? Sure. So Aurelius Digital is a, an angel investment network which we run here all in Melbourne and also in Perth. It's been very successful at reducing the friction which exists between, uh, I guess, uh, entrepreneurs finding uh, investors. Uh, and finding good quality investors. So what we do is effectively remove that friction by uh, pre-qualifying a number of uh, investment opportunities and also pre-qualifying on the other side the investors who actually get into the room. Um, angel investment uh, in probably most markets, but certainly observed here in Australia, has become somewhat of a badge of honour and, uh, and sometimes that doesn't yield to the most positive of, uh, of outcomes. So hence why Aurelius Digital was, was created to remove that friction. So it's a, it's a dinner uh, which is run quarterly and we generally have about 50 people in attendance. But, uh, but Loku was actually uh, assessed as interesting but, uh, but not ready because uh, I guess the, the candidate companies that, uh, that do get through generally have built their MVP and have, have initial signs of traction. Um, so in that case, uh, I guess there, there was there was a no, but equally it was a uh, it was something that, that we were impressed by because we uh, between Darcy and I we were both impressed with the team, we were impressed with their conviction of their uh, uh, their vision, um, and that there was a clear match between the, the the skills and the team that they were actually starting to form to solve that uh, that that problem and uh, and achieve that vision. So. They were really the, the, the I guess, the, the, the building blocks or the foundation of, uh, of further discussion. And so, did you mention to one-to-one -one cast or local as it was then what they needed to do in order to meet the hurdles for you to make an investment in them? I uh, we kept the conversation open. Um, I guess we we said that we were you know, because we were impressed, we were willing to continue to engage as they continued to refine the idea. Um, we felt that uh, one of the pieces of the puzzle that was maybe missing was uh, was some further. I guess uh, you know technology. So because they'd spoken of a of a third partner joining, um, you know, one of the things that we look at quite critically is the the founding team DNA, as we term it. Um, so it's a, I guess the classical um, description of that these days is the the hacker, the hustler, uh, and the designer. And I guess uh, you know Ed's the master uh, hustler. Uh, Andrew, who I don't think is with us tonight, is, uh, is the back-end hacker and he's, uh, he's very impressive at what he does. Uh, and Long, in terms of his bias of strength, is, uh, is very much the designer. But it's not a 
you know, a, a, a zero and one or digital equation in that uh, you know, each of these, uh, these guys actually has a very strong and balanced skill set. It's just where they have a natural affinity and, and where they've actually grown as a team to, to, to very much complement one another. And that's where, what we really, I guess, were, were, were very attracted to. And, uh, and it's very much a d determining factor as to our investment decision beyond the, the more classical uh, assessments that we can make with uh, you know, uh, MBA-style analysis, um, market analysis, etc. Okay, and if you if you take a step back and I guess look from a high level, there's the work that goes into doing um, courting each other, finding out if you want to be in a company or if one to one cast is a company that in which you want to invest, and the same for one to one cast to find out if they want to be a company that you invest in. From memory, the deal was done in about October last year. Mid-November. Mid-November. Okay, mid-November 2012. So what, if we look at the, the deal from beforehand, the actual negotiation of the deal and then, and then signing the deal and getting the cash in the bank and then what's happened afterwards, what happened between February and mid-November in terms of, I guess, the courtship and then actually starting to negotiate a deal? At what point did you say, yes, we do want to do this? Mm -hmm. And what steps needed to happen to, to get there and then what's happened, happened afterwards. Yeah, sure. So um, I guess in terms of uh, you know, what happened, there was actually two stages to it. So there was actually an initial stage which was probably executed in May, I would say. Yep. Um, and then there was essentially a second stage where effectively uh, we led, a, led the round and, uh, and had uh, Singtel's Innovate Fund uh, join us as well. Um, in a follow-on round, so. So the initial round in May, can you describe a bit about what that was? Just as money to tide the founders over while I tried to get a bit more, I guess, uh, build the product out or get a bit more validation. What was the purpose of that? Yeah, so so the initial uh, round of funding was very much, uh, I guess, you know, I guess in terms of its negotiation, it was an ongoing conversation that started in uh, in February and continued on. Uh, both Darcy and I actually then spent the majority of actually March in the United States. Um, so we had a few phone calls, but through which we essentially uh, identified a couple of different options to, uh, to work with um, the, uh, the, the, the now one-to-one -one cast team, because I think our, some of our initial feedback was that we didn't like the name. So uh, <laughs> um, as, uh, as things go forward, I guess, uh, you know, Loku is actually another, uh, a name of another business uh, globally anyway, um, but one-to-one -one cast was actually sort of emerged and Andrew actually joined, joined the team. Um, and uh, I distinctly remember that we were having a conversation. We were in the uh, the, the car park of the Rosewood Hotel, um, and uh, and effectively had a a call to say there's two ways we can support you. We can essentially just give you general guidance, or we can essentially uh, look to uh, to essentially give you the the money that you need to to essentially stop everything else that you were doing and focus on this 100% uh, and give it a run um, because you know really we felt that the it you know to to be distracted by trying to do too many things um, was not going to see their vision um, or their pursuit of their vision uh, effectively um, achieved. And so we, uh, I guess, in the during that conversation, which was a, to, to be honest, a real pain in the ass because we sort of had dropouts because of United States sort of cell phone coverage and data coverage and everything else, um, which was not only frustrating for us uh, on one end of the phone, but I'm sure equally frustrating uh, on, on the other end. Yeah, I was in Sydney on my lunch break. That was tough. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So uh, anyway, um, won't go into too much more of that detail, but uh, but effectively we we nutted out that we wanted to uh, to actually uh, give uh, give the guy the ability to, to really focus on this and uh, and give uh, I guess you know particularly uh, you know Ed the ability to, uh, to to take some time and to actually co-locate with the team at the York Butter Factory to uh, to, to take the next steps um, and so essentially there was probably about another two and a half three weeks that uh, before we actually returned back to Australia and, and took those next steps um, and that's really where I guess we had ongoing negotiations as to uh, as to how the the documentation between us uh, would be would be settled, so uh, and how was it settled then? I was settled with an excellent deal, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, nah, so yeah, we we found we found Stu and um, they kind of put an offer to us and two offers. You know, um, or yeah, two <laughs> options, but there was one we kind of clearly wanted. Um, Why? Because one actually involved, I guess, us getting some some funding and kind of taking it to the next step. And I guess for me, I'd said to the other guys like. I don't want to quit my job and move states unless, you know, some people kind of think this thing has legs that aren't us. Mm -hmm. And I guess getting some venture capitalists to, I guess, 
show interest and want to do a deal with us was enough, I guess, traction for me to justify, you know, quitting my job and moving back to Melbourne. And um, so, yeah, we, you know, we're really excited to, to get, I guess, the proposal of, I guess, an, an offer from the adventure capital guys. But then, you know, after a while, the, the, the novelty and the excitement of, you know, knowing that there's something there kind of wore off and we had to actually start, like, looking, you know, is, is this best? Um, who can we get a second opinion from? Um, is there someone else we should be speaking to? There was, I guess, there was a lot of thought that, that went into the next steps. Did you speak to other investors? So we found um, I had had someone I'd kind of use as an independent mentor who was in the venture capital kind of scene for a long time, who'd done deals and had done some stuff in Europe. And he, he gave me some feedback and, and kind of gave me good questions to ask. So we had follow-up calls and we asked those questions, we got good answers and then he was happy with kind of the feedback we got. And what kind of questions were they? Um, well, what think, advice would you give to a startup who's looking at getting money, they got offered money? And then, you know, what kind of questions would you want to ask? What kind of due diligence would you do on the venture capitalist, so to speak? So I'd go and speak to some people in the companies they've already funded and find out if they're actually like enjoying the relationship and they've, they've found it good. Because money is only a small part of it. Like what, I guess what a lot of people don't see is like, we sit a few desks away from Stu and Darcy and, and we're only a phone call away from, I guess, David in America. And we, we speak to them a lot and send them a lot of emails. When Stu said, you know, go, Go, go poke Ed and he'll, he'll give me um, an intro. I only intro someone to Stu if I think it's really worth doing because I'd rather have that half an hour or hour of time to get help with my business. So, um, yeah, you know, are the, are the other portfolio companies, like, happy? Would they, would they say good things? Um, which, you know, hopefully you've gone and spoken to them anyway when you're doing the introduction, so you, they're, they're good to kind of speak to. Um, I'd also find out how interested in your product they are. So when we, when we first pitched to Darcy, his eyes lit up and he got the idea straight away and by the end of it could almost you know, pitch it himself to us. He was that excited by it. And we kind of knew that these guys wanted that product and they wanted to use it themselves. And what our product did was fit in very well with the scope of the fund. Like their, you know, their fund was about getting Australian companies that are doing digital and helping them you know, grow big and then you know, taking it kind of abroad as well. And that's exactly what we wanted to do. And the fact that they had connections on the ground in the US of guys who'd kind of done this stuff before that we could leverage, especially for us, I guess, advertising was one of the big revenue models for us. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they had a guy who had done a lot with advertising and was kind of recognized in the industry was really helpful for us, just being able to get access to that. Okay. So that kind of... No, it does, yeah. I mean, I guess you're looking at the, the different assets the venture capitalists can provide beyond the cash, the introductions, yeah. the, the knowledge, the know-how. Do you, I mean, the, so the $250,000 round was done in November 2012. So at what point did you start talking about $250,000 and at what point did you start nutting out a term sheet or, or having those kind of awkward conversations around value and those sorts of things? And what was, I guess, what was the process in, involved in, okay, now we need to get some more money, we're going to run out of cash soon. What do you need to do to get Adventure Capital to give you some more cash? So we had, we could, we could have lived off personal savings till about the end of the year and we kind of said we'll give it a go and just go until then and kind of see what happens. But obviously the sooner we could get money and accelerate it, the better because we, we knew that what we were doing, other people would come and do soon. So if we had the chance to accelerate that, that was something we definitely wanted to do. Um, for us it was about getting like traction and actually kind of validating part of the concept. So the actual product we wanted to build, the personalised radio app, um, I guess there are a lot of complex pieces that come together to make it work. So what we did is we built just 10% of it as a separate app called SoundGecko. And we actually did a soft launch and just kind of put that out there. And that got users and that got us data and feedback and that... How many that, users did you get? On our first month, we got about 25,000. And how many do you have now? Over 200,000. And so you used that as a product initially to gain some understanding of the market. In yeah, it was, a, it was a way to prove that, you know, if we could, without spending any marketing, we could just deliver a piece and still get people using that and get people excited about by it. That also proved the team could build things, they could ship things, and it kind of add a lot of credibility. And that, I guess, was really important in, I guess, validating what our team could do and where this was going. And that got Singtel really excited, and that also got the AC guys really excited. I know we also engaged Singtel, I guess, earlier than we, we needed them. And the feedback we had from them was like, yeah, we want you to build something and put it out there, which is exactly what the AC guys had said as well. So the Singtel Optus Innovate program, they had a pitch night in Sydney for companies. When was that? 
and you went up there to Sydney to pitch to their... Uh, that was July 31st last year. So July 31st, so then July and then it took, what, five months to go from meeting Optus, and this is another thing I want to explore as well, how it went co-investing with another company. But you went up to, to pitch to them, they liked the idea, they didn't like the fact they hadn't built something already or hadn't launched it. You put something out there. Uh, so we saw them a bit earlier, so just, just to kind of timeline it. Jan, we came up with the idea. Feb, we actually started the business, did the kind of quit the job thing. Um, around kind of uh, May, we fully locked up a deal with, with Adventure Capital and we were working out of their, uh, out of the co-working space, the York Butter Factory. Then in June, um, we went to a conference in Singapore called Echelon and that's where we met Singtel and we pitched to them and they gave us some really good feedback. And then kind of at the end of June, they announced this program and because we're a mobile app and we, we fitted in really well with what they wanted there, we already knew what they were looking for and it kind of had all the holes poked for our idea. So by the time it came to pitching and kind of going through those progression rounds they did in, in July, we, we knew exactly what they wanted to hear and we knew how to kind of fix our business. Mm -hmm. And so we had that pitch day um, at the end of July and by then SoundGecko had been out for three weeks and we had users and things were kind of on the up. Um, we got, I guess we got interest that they'd like to invest a couple of weeks after. And then it just getting all the final parts of the deal yeah, is what took a couple of months. Because we needed to work out, you know, who else do we want in on this deal? Exactly how much money do we need? The team also went to the US um, for a month in between that, which really slowed things down. But we were also able to kind of test the US market and kind of get, I guess, get feedback from those guys and have a much better idea of um, where we're at fundraising wise. And so after you came back from the US, that was what, in July, August? Uh, the U.S. trip was September. September, okay. And so you came back from the U.S. trip in September. What was involved in starting the negotiation process around the $250,000 investment? I mean, maybe from Stu's point of view, I mean, at what point did you start saying, all right, here's the initial term sheet, let's have a look at it and start sussing it out? Did you have to talk to, and this is something we touched on before, did you have to talk to one to one cast as a team and try and help them understand what a term sheet actually looked like, what it was supposed to be in there, why things were in there, what was good for them, what necessarily maybe was in your advantage as opposed to theirs? Yep. When did that process start and what was involved and, and how did you tackle that issue? Yeah, I guess it's, uh, they'd already been through the term sheet sort of uh, process once or actually even twice by this stage. And uh, I guess as a, as a board as we had formed, so advisory board come actually formal board of directors, we, we were sort of you know, formalising the company and bringing all that together. Um, we'd actually identified out in front that, uh, that we felt that uh, Singtel would be a smart investor. So Innovate would be a good investor to actually bring in because of their strategic benefit. It wasn't their money, it was more about the strategic benefits. So I guess you know, what we did was we knew that the, the Singtel Innovate seed program was coming up, the Optus seed program. So we actually, in a lot of ways, I guess, targeted that. We also understood the structure of that program. So we know that the structure of that program is, you know, we know that they need co-investors, so they actually prefer to, to follow a deal rather than lead a deal. Um, so I guess it's sort of, you know, it's, uh, you know, when you can actually gain insights as to exactly the, the investment style, uh, particularly if there are programs, say, like the, the, the Optus Seed Innovate uh, or Optus Seed program, um, educating yourself as to essentially the, the structure and the opportunity and the, the flexibility and, and how you can, I guess, maximise the benefit from it um, is really, really important. Uh, in that case, it was also, we knew that they were actually issuing uh, convertible notes as well. So we actually thought that that was an even better opportunity um, to, to actually test the uh, strategic value of the relationship. And so you probably notice that, that, that in some ways we've, the, 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 the description I'm now giving is actually one not just of essentially the side of the venture capitalist, but actually much more of essentially how do we actually accelerate uh, the one-to-one -one cast business into, uh, into market for maximum success. Um, now, in some ways, you could say, well, that's just the venture capitalist being selfish because you know, the, 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 the more successful our portfolio companies are, uh, the, the, the better off we actually do, which is fine. Uh, we definitely uh, align the interests of our investors all the way through to our investees. Um, but I think that the, you know, the key thing is, is that uh, it's the relationship between um, you know, both uh, the portfolio company and the investor which is so critical as to its potential for success. 
Um, you don't go out on a Friday night and essentially, uh, or rarely do you go out on a Friday night and then essentially come home married the next day and expect that it's going to be successful. Um, it's not Vegas. Um, and Vegas weddings generally don't work out so well. In the same way, um, investment is, uh, is, is, is also like that. Um, in the Silicon Valley, certainly deals move faster. Here in Australia, much more conservative, so it takes time to build those relationships out. Um, they're hard won, uh, but those hard won relationships are the ones that are going to stick by you when stuff gets hard. And be sure, as an entrepreneur, stuff is going to get hard, it's going to get complex, things are not going to go your way. Um, what was the worst part about negotiating the deal for you? Um, for us, I guess, uh, you know, when you've done a few deals, you actually sort of, you know, very quickly are able to focus in on the important parts of a deal. Um, as a new entrepreneur or somebody who maybe hasn't done negotiation before or doesn't have a background in, uh, in, in legal documents or contracts, um, sometimes you resort back to effectively every term being equally important as the others. Um, and that essentially it's a, it's a zero-sum game. So for every point that you win, uh, I lose. Every point that I win, you lose. Um, that's not a great place to sort of start. So uh, certainly in the earlier negotiations with the, with the team, we did feel that in some instances we were negotiating around things which we felt to be quite immaterial. And, uh, and I guess you know, what it was demonstrating was you know, what's important to this team. So you know, in some ways, you know, as you negotiate something, you're actually, in a lot of ways, under the microscope. So this is a, you know, maybe one of your first high stakes uh, engagements associated with your business. You're very passionate about it. You want to make sure that it works. You've got these venture capitalists that you've heard of as vulture capitalists sitting across the other side of the table. Um, you know, are they doing the right thing by you? Or, uh, or is this essentially a nasty little uh, trick which has got a big sting in the tail that you just don't know what you don't know about? Um, and I think that you know, getting the right advice is important in, uh, in getting that. So I remember there was a couple of terms and uh, you know, to the point where effectively I was pretty close to saying, this is the deal. Um, if you don't want the deal, if this is essentially too, too hard, then it is actually getting too hard for us for, for what it is. So, um, you know, we, uh, I must admit, I did get frustrated in, uh, in the early negotiations with this, with this deal. And Ed, for you? <laughs> Coming back oh, to that. Man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I guess from our, uh, our perspective, right, we'd, 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 um, we'd quit our jobs, we'd gone all in on this, and we were so excited to be you know, having our own company, and then this first deal, getting it right, was really important. And I guess we'd, we'd found a few different people who were giving us advice, and it got hard. All the advice was conflicting. Um, you know, the things were time sensitive. We could tell um, after a while that, yeah, the guys, they were spending a lot of time, I guess, educating us on certain things and pointing us in the right direction so we could make informed decisions, which most places won't take the time to do. And um, yeah, eventually we we're able to come to something where, you know, everyone, everyone was happy. But I guess it's also, also really hard when, you know, looking at the money aside, all the, all the strategic fit and all the help you're gonna get, you can't, it's hard to get a feel of how much of that you'll actually get down, down the road. Like I guess in the US, I've, I've read of you know, companies where it hasn't started going that well, so the, you know, the, the VCs will focus on other parts of the portfolio or you know, can they do what, what they say and it's really, really hard to, to measure. And so we, I guess we, we focused on some of the non, I guess, some of the things that were more measurable and that we had a greater, I guess, idea of. Um, whereas the, I guess from those guys, they, they saw the, the money is not as important about getting the good foundation, which would lead to all the other things coming. And yeah, I guess getting that good foundation was, was something that happened and we're, we're very happy about. So at the point where Stu said, this is the deal, this is the best we can do, either take it or leave it, what did you guys do then? Did you go away and have a conversation about it and realise, yes, this is definitely the benefits outweigh the costs, we want to go ahead with this, obviously that's what happened, but did you kind of realise, okay, we now need to just do it? What, what um, was your thought process then, I suppose? Oh, look, we always wanted to do the, the deal, but um, it just, just took, a, took a while. I guess we'd, we'd, have a, we'd have a meeting and discuss, whenever we had a meeting with those guys, we'd go, go afterwards and kind of go somewhere else and just say what our, our gut feel was after the meeting. And then we'd all hear each other's points and then take some time to reflect. 
potentially speak to, I guess, some of our advisors and just, just have a bit of a think. And then we'd come back and say, all right, this is, this is where we're at. And um, I guess, yeah, we got to a point where we were really happy. And you said you got the deal done. Got the deal done. How long from signing the papers until the cash was in the bank? Uh, ooh, I think it was long, a week or? That's pretty quick. Yeah. yeah. And so what happens, well, I mean, I guess there's probably a fair bit of relief after the deal has been done. You can walk away and start focusing on actually building a business as opposed to getting some cash to build a business. What was the, I guess, what is the, I guess, the, the key benefits that, that a venture capital bring beyond the cash that's helped you grow one to one cast? Um, oh, it, it ranges just fit all the way is really small things like just having a fresh set of eyes to look at to all the way to you know coming with us on a trip where we're looking to raise funds or looking to get some partnerships. Um, I've spent time with, with Darcy, the, one of the other partners in, in Singapore and in London. I've spent a lot of time with Stu in Sydney and in the US and they, they just help us in so many ways. Intros to people, um, preparation for meetings, you know, give, giving us feedback and to, you know, here's how this fits in strategically, here's how we think you should play it. Um, just a, a sounding board on, on, I guess, what we're trying to solve at that time. Introduce, introducing us to other companies and their portfolio who can help us. Um, you know, all there's lots. Okay. And Stu, have you got anything from one to one cast aside from having another company in the portfolio and aside from having giving them the cash? What other benefits have you received from that relationship? Um, well, I think that uh, you know, I guess it's having a successful portfolio company is uh, is, is a great benefit to a uh, to a venture fund. Obviously, to have showcases uh, is is really important. Um, you know, you want to have a positive relationship with those that uh, that I guess that you're working with, because that in and of itself is actually rewarding. So you know, there's many reasons why people do things. Like some people do things purely for the money. Um, to be honest, essentially, the money ultimately ends up being a byproduct. Um, of effectively, you know, the, I guess the reward that both Darcy and I get from working with, with awesome entrepreneurs um, who are taking the risks, you know, putting it all in line to actually pursue their vision and to, to do it in a lot of ways without, uh, you know, uh, without care almost for, for the risks in some ways. Um, so no, it's, it, it's, it's actually quite rewarding to, uh, to, to watch and observe and, and actually, I guess, in some ways, be part of the, the, the progress um, of, the, uh, of our portfolio company. But uh, I guess, you know, the, the earliest investment that we've ever made is, is certainly the, the, the one-to-one cast investment. So we sort of went outside of our comfort zone in making, uh, in making this deal. Okay. And so now that the deal is, that was done in, obviously, uh, November <coughs> last year, how close do you work together now with the company and how involved are you? You obviously got an advisor board that you sit on. What, how involved are you in terms of the management decisions and the governance of the company? I mean, do you ever have uh, issues with you know, one person deciding one thing is best for the company and having heating, heated discussions around that sort of stuff? Or is it at the stage now where you've, you've, everyone who's at the advisory board, everyone who's involved in I guess, the management of that company has all effectively got the same vision in mind and understanding what needs to be done in order to get there? Yeah. Well, I think one of the, 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 one of the uh, best things about the, the relationship is that there is a united uh, vision that is shared between all parties. Um, I think that we've also managed to almost, just as much as we've got a, um, uh, a very solid founding team, um, that, that both Darcy and I, in terms of our uh, support to the team, each bring something which is different and unique. So I sit on the board of, uh, of One to One Cast and I guess focus more on the governance and, uh, and I guess commercial or uh, strategic aspects um, and provide, I guess, you know, uh, a sounding board for those those matters, uh, whereas Darcy is, uh, I guess, more focused uh, on the operational sort of sides of the business. So he works, uh, you know, more closely in providing support to, um, you know, the HR and operational factors of, uh, of the business, which, you know, as an entrepreneur, you may be, you know, I guess, focused initially on, on building an awesome product and getting it to market, uh, but ultimately you need to think about building a business. And so these operational aspects are, are non-trivial particularly if you're looking to build something which has got a, a foundation to sustain very significant growth. So I think that you know, the, you know, in terms of how much we work with them, they actually, you know, as, as Ed, sa- Ed, sa- oh, sorry, Ed said, um, sit only metres from us. So I guess you know, we're, uh, we're only sort of a, uh, a, a chair uh, turn away almost in a, in a lot of cases. Um, but the, the, 
yeah, once again, I think that uh, it's a quite good symbiotic relationship that uh, they're able to draw value from um, without creating dependency as a, as a sort of a key point because as an entrepreneur, you didn't do it to essentially find yourself another boss. You did it to essentially create, in a lot of ways, your own freedom and, uh, and to pursue your own vision, not somebody, somebody else's. Is there anything that you would have done differently? Um, look, I think that uh, you know, entrepreneurship again is uh, is quite emergent in nature. Um, so you know, there, there's probably not a lot which I would have changed in uh, you know to date. Um, you know, I guess you know, looking back with the benefit of 100% hindsight, you know, would we have sort of you know given slightly different guidance, knowing what we know now in terms of you know direction that type of thing? Marginally, I think there would have been probably fine tuning, but uh, you know, I think the the guys have uh, have worked hard, they've learned hard, um, and uh, and are putting themselves in uh, in a position whereby they uh, they have the best potential of success. Ed, we're about to ask the the audience some questions. Is there anything else that you would like to bring up in what it's been like to start a company, obtain some financial support from a venture capitalist? Um, you've been a bit of a roller coaster ride for the last year and a half. Any, uh, any other things that you would like to bring up about how this deal came about, where the company's at now? Anything yeah, I'd, I'd definitely say, um, yeah, you mentioned heated discussions before. They definitely happen, but it's heated because we've all got so much passion for, I guess, the idea and the business and each other. And um, we kind of have those discussions and work out where, everyone, where everyone's at and kind of come up with a, with a conclusion. Um, in terms of the, the money side, I guess a lot of people get excited and they, they see things on TechCrunch like this company raised this amount of money. Once you've got the money, you need to use it wisely and make sure it gets you to the next step. And a lot of people, I guess, as soon as as soon as we had raised money, a lot of people were trying to get us to sign up for things, or a lot of people were, I guess, had different expectations. And I guess um, it's important to try and find that <coughs> fine line of um, what's the right amount to spend. Like obviously, you know, some some tools you could get, you know, they can you can save a lot of people time because you need to build that yourself or you can get that expertise. But there are some other things that you really probably shouldn't be doing when you're, you know, when you're venture funded and you've you've got to, you know, work towards like profitability. So I'd say the it's just a step. Like when it's once you get there, you've still got a lot of work to do. Don't don't feel like the I guess all the hard work's over and you're you're set. What are the next steps for one to one gast? Uh, we've just been, I guess, under a rock the last few months, just getting ready for this launch in about a week. So, um, yeah, just taking the product to market, getting it in, in front of people's hands and making sure they're getting the, the best user experience from it. And for the next six to 12 months, what are your, I guess, goals for one time cast? Um, just, I, I guess, growth. Just so we're starting with just the Australian market, learning, learning about the Australian market, you know, how can we make the product even better and get people, you know, using it more and getting the, the most out of it. And then once we've kind of nailed that down, we'll, we'll go to other markets when appropriate. Okay. Rightio, Stu, is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, I probably would reinforce uh, Ed's last point, though, that, uh, you know, success is not getting funded. Um, you know, success comes a lot later uh, in the piece. So, um, you know, it's how you actually use the resources that you've got both before funding and after funding, uh, which is extraordinarily telling on uh, your potential for success. Um, so, you know, focusing yourself 100% on just getting venture capital as the answer, um, it's only one part of the answer and one part of the journey. Uh, and it comes with it, as I mentioned before, a lot of obligation because you're now dealing with other people's money. Um, and that come, with that comes significant responsibility. Uh, which you know, different people take in different uh, in different lights. There isn't sort of a, a, ma a magic montage which happens instantly after the money appears in your bank account that success just falls upon you. Um, there is equal measures, if not more, uh, of hard work which needs to follow to uh, to see that success uh, realised. Okay. Well, hopefully that's I guess given a fairly detailed understanding of the, the venture capital process, investing in a company. But I've got some time of questions for the audience. So does anyone have a question for either Stu or Ed? We've got one over here. We'll just wait for the microphone, Alex, and bring it over. Hi. Um, my question is probably more for Stu. I was just interested in how you go about valuing a company at such an early stage, whether you have like a required rate of return or you try and forecast cash flows. I was just interested in that process. Yeah, I guess it depends upon what information you actually have at hand. Um, you know, uh, depending upon, you know, say with the one-to-one -one cast deal specifically, there was 
uh, they'd, they'd come up with some basic uh, financial forecasts. That shows a level of discipline, which we quite like. Uh, equally, we expect that uh, you know, the first time you actually develop one of these forecasts, chances are it's, it's going to be wrong. Uh, and and you know, it's going to be probably 95% wrong. But the discipline of actually going through the process and how you actually put that together is very important. So to answer the top level question, uh, how do we value these companies? It's both a, a mixture of art and science. It's comparables. It's essentially what we think the market potential is. Um, it's how much money is required as well. So you know, are we comfortable with taking just 1% of a deal uh, or do we need something which is more material? And the answer to that is yes, we need something which is more material. So if, as, uh, as Adventure Capital, we're looking for significant minority interests. Um, so we'd be looking to take you know, uh, anywhere between sort of you know, 10 and 40% uh, of a business over its, uh, over its life cycle and that depends upon co-investors and a whole heap of other factors. Um, but the traditional methods of, uh, of developing a, a financial forecast, uh, a cash flow forecast, which then a discounted cash flow uh, can be done, or a discounted valuation, DCF uh, valuation can be done from, is a, is, is a measure. Uh, comparables is also another one, um, and you should inform yourself about those when you come to, uh, to I guess, expect it. Um, another key point around valuations here in Australia, you, you should expect that they are a lot lower than they are in the Silicon Valley, and that's a direct representation of the amount of venture capital which is here uh, in Australia. It's, uh, it's about 10% per capita of what, uh, what exists in the United States, um, which then magnifies because of the, the Silicon Valley effect uh, by probably another 10%, if not more. We've got one here. Um, yeah, it's also for Stu, I was sort of going to ask that last question, but in that same context, how do you sort of gauge how much you want to take of the business at different stages and how would you sort of develop your exit strategy in the longer term? Like when would, would you do that early on or would you... Yeah. Yeah, so in terms of uh, you know, thinking through uh, exits, uh, you know, as, a, as a fund manager, you're always looking for you know, ultimately where a liquidity event will occur. In the venture game, that's not as easy as going and selling some shares on a, on a public market. Um, until recently, the IPO window was pretty much firmly closed. Um, so the, the likelihood of a business actually IPOing was very low. So that left trade sales really as the mechanism by which the exits truly occurred. Um, or that you might be able to find a secondaries market where somebody may actually buy your investment out at a, at a higher rate. Um, you know, for us, we, we talk about the fact that we, we I guess, uh, assess a business as to its, uh, I guess, terminal value and terminal exit sort of mechanism. Um, so we're already thinking about the market in which that, uh, that you're looking to, to disrupt and to attack and where the likely exits would, uh, would occur in terms of uh, trade sales predominantly. Um, but equally, you wouldn't, uh, you know, if you get a business which is going to run hard, then, uh, then, then maybe an IPO is an opportunity. Uh, that said, for adventure capital in terms of our purposes, we're an early stage investor. We're investing at series C to series A. Um, you know, generally you're going to get a, a series B, C, D and maybe even an E round, so many rounds of funding prior to essentially a, an IPO happening. In which case, you know, we're, we're probably only going to end up with, uh, with maybe you know, less than 10% of the business. The idea being that obviously you're looking for a much bigger slice of the pie. Um, but I guess you know, in every round that we, we, we make, both essentially initial and follow on, we're thinking about you know, is this good money uh, going into the business? Is it likely to essentially deliver a rate of return? And in terms of that rate of return, if we can't see 10x on that money coming back out again, chances are we're, we're going to be thinking twice. So I had a question here. Um, so, what are the terms of the deal? And then for Stu, what are the terms that made you nearly walk away? And then for Ed, why did you push so hard for them? Uh, so it's all about money and control. So how much how much money are you, are you getting, like cash you can spend? And then um, what valuation is that at? So like how much are you giving away? And then once that's sorted, what, what is the control? Like if you want to sell your company, do you need their approval or you know, can you do what you want? And so, um, do you have like specifics? Do you want to um, <laughs> are we we kept all of that? I guess 
confidential, but uh, the the amount raised, um, the the two fifty is what I guess was is publicly available. I may just mention that Stu and Ed did get together before tonight and agree on what they would and wouldn't say, uh, and so there might be yeah, a few questions that are probably a little bit too detailed and won't get answered. But yeah, it's about it's about finding the balance. So um, from their perspective, if they you know if they they provide capital for a company and, and help it grow, and then there's you know there's an exit opportunity that would really help the founders, but just I guess destroy all the all the all the shareholders. They don't they don't really want that. But at the same time, um, as an entrepreneur, you you want them to I guess ha have input and be able to stop you from doing anything crazy. But you don't want them to stop you doing everything. So it's about finding that right level of control. And I, I think the hardest part of it was we had no. They see deals every day. We'd never seen deals before, so we didn't know what the norm was, and it was hard to kind of get an understanding of that. Um, in terms of yeah, I guess you know why do I why did I almost walk away? I guess we we we, we kept on circulating around the same point, which uh, which actually was in regards to the ability of the founders to have um, external employment from memory. Um, so that was that was a, I think one of the key key sort of you know points where I think you know from the founders' point of view they wanted to be able to sustain their savings so be able to have a job outside of working on the the startup and we were uh, saying that the sole purpose of this funding initially was to to absolutely 100% focus on getting the MVP built um, and we really did uh, circulate around that sort of issue a, a few times and I think. Each of the individuals within the founding team had uh, you know, uh, a slightly different sort of you know, perspective, and probably individually had different circumstances which drove their requirements. So, you know, they may have been giving away you know, sort of you know, uh, different different things. They may have been uh, accustomed to different lifestyles. So, it's it's always going to be independent and individual. But that was that was certainly the you know one of the key points. So, to to circulate back around on that. Um, if an investor is investing in you to actually build a business, chances are that's all they want you to do. Um, they don't want you getting distracted. They want you to be 100% focused, 110% focused on, on seeing that business to be successful. Hi, um, Ed. Um, when you resist a fund, like what do you guys fo like? Look, how do you guys allocate the fund? Like maybe 10% marketing and 90% for the product. Or outsourcing, like so. Our um, pretty much all of our money to date has been spent on just just people. So um, we've got a very, I guess, we had a very strong tech team in foundation. Like all three of our um, founders were technical, and we just saw it as here's where we wanted to be. Um, we know the market's going to go there. The sooner we can do it, the better. So just uh, I guess extra developers or contractors kind of helped us out giving ourselves a modest salary, um, some software licensing, some, some online SaaS tools that helped us out, but pretty much all of it's been um, people. With our first product, SoundGecko, we didn't do any marketing. With our launch coming up, we're doing, doing a bit, but it's, yeah, for us, it's, it's been about um, mainly towards people, but we came up with a, with a budget um, when we kind of proposed ra raising money, and the, um, the AC guys and the Singtel guys kind of both went through that, and gave us their opinion and you know it has changed over time but um, th that's where most of our money goes. Yeah, but so do you reckon like making great products like it will do the marketing automatically like you don't really like as long as the product is great you don't need marketing? Uh, even if you have a great product if you're not getting it in front of people it's, it's gonna be a real problem. Um, I guess what the VCs are scared of is a lot of people you know I guess get agencies helping them or you know spend money on billboards or all these ads and um, there's, there's, I guess it's about doing marketing in really smart ways and also testing that the product's ready before you put it out there. So if you put something out there and you spend all this money marketing and then no one comes back, that's really bad. You want to test that first and, and make sure that those people are actually going to come back and they're interested before you put, I guess, marketing dollars behind that. And there's some, some really good posts online about things like growth hacking, about how we've, you know, not not doing that much, you can get a lot of users and do some really clever things. And that's, that's really big in Silicon Valley and it's starting to get quite big here. All right, um, so, sorry, second questions. Um, last semester I visited my office, like visited you guys, 
And I realize you guys have like the strongest like technical team like among the like the other like map winners. Like how you guys actually achieve that? Like all all of you guys are so strong in technical and then working on it dedicatedly. Oh, I think it's horses for courses. Like for our idea, we needed the very strong tech team. But if you look at one of the other teams last year, um, Braden's team, you know, he's he's an engineer. He's very technical and he's got the right skill set for the project he's doing. The guys doing Venue Mob, um, you know, made a company around group buying and I guess built up, you know, a sales expertise, marketing expertise, and knew how to run a business involving that really well and got acquired. They're they're great for the business that they're doing, and I think, um, yeah, you need to get the skills that'll suit the idea that you have and that you want to make happen. And then the money should just kind of stimulate that and accelerate it. Cool. Last couple of questions, we've got one here. Yes. Um, was your idea ever hampered by a previously registered patent? And how'd you go about you know, bypassing that if it was? Um, IP is a really interesting one. So when we when we first started, like we we couldn't really we didn't have the resources to tell. We were just trying to we didn't want to worry about that until we actually worked out if people were actually were that interested. Um, we got all our name, we got all our brands, all our names, I guess, trademarked. And there are certain parts of what we're doing that is patentable that we're investigating. But the thing about patents is if you've if you've got them, it, it makes sense for some businesses. Some businesses it doesn't. If we um, if we got Patents, we'd need to have the money to defend them, and at this stage, we, we don't. Um, I guess the other thing is um, we couldn't find anyone who was doing anything like we were doing, so, um, yeah, did we, I mean, did you, yeah. Yeah, no, I guess we, we did our uh, assessment based upon, uh, I guess, a number of different things, and so certainly part of it was because with even the, the first application, um, you know, dealing with content uh, was somewhat of a, of a minefield. So it was certainly one of the risks that we did explore in making our investment decision. Um, and I guess we put, uh, put the founders to, to task as to essentially responding to how they were going to develop that. And, uh, and their answers were certainly something that, that uh, were very informative as to how do you actually assess a problem as, a, as an entrepreneur, how do you go about sort of, you know, determining whether, you know, that, uh, that you know, you were going to, to, to find yourself in a patent issue, um, how are you dealing with IP, how you uh, sort advice, those types of things. Yeah, so with that I'd say our technology was getting a few different things already out there and bringing it together. And from a protection point of view, a lot of the clever things we do happen in the back end and people don't know how we do those. Um, and in terms of the IP stuff, if someone, I guess, does, if we do uh, conflict with something, we'll, we'll come to that challenge when it happens. But from what we've been able to see and people we've spoken to, um, it, it hasn't been an issue yet. And probably one last question. Z, do you want to... Oh, you want a few more? Uh, we haven't had many guys here or here. Oh, share well, right Ed, was you, you running there? Okay. They get those drinks up. Mm -hmm. um, so, touching on Stu's point about different uh, valuations between here and Silicon Valley, and you were obviously there seeking. Well, I don't know if you were actually seeking funding. So, how did you, you know, go there, talk to people there, um, and then was there like a bit of a competition thing where you were thinking, do I raise from home or do I raise from there, or was it even an option? How did you think about that? You're talking about our recent trip or very early on, like with September last year after both. Um, so, yeah, we just, so, so we went last year in September after we'd kind of already done one deal with AC and we're looking to do another with AC and Singtel. Um, we met investors there and kind of started building some relationships. It's really hard to meet someone and then get them to give you a check right away. It's, it's better if they have more data points. And the feedback we got was we, we needed to do more to, to raise the type of round we wanted over there. And those, to get the full, I guess, benefit out of a lot of those investors, we would have needed to move to the US or be at a later stage where we'll say at a growth stage where a lot of their expertise we could really utilize and accelerate. So that gave us a great foundation and made us realize that for us, the best thing to do was to stay in Australia, um, you know, get, get some capital from local investors who had good strategic value and then, you know, get to the next, get to the next milestone, which was launching our app, which is yeah, coming up very soon. I'm conscious of time, but Ed wants to answer a few more questions. We do have uh, beers and nibbles waiting out the front, but maybe we'll take a few more if you're keen to answer some more. So Dan, and then maybe one out of the front here as well. Thanks. 
Um, this is a double-edged question for both for Ed and for Stuart. Um, was there a, a question about whether you should have bootstrapped for longer before you actually sought money? And for Stuart, um, how does that um, uh, that question play as well? Should Ed have, or should a startup consider bootstrapping for longer before they actually raise? Yeah, I think the uh, you know the reality is is that it's just got cheaper and cheaper uh, to actually start a business and to actually get something going. So. Um, to be able to demonstrate, you know, some level of traction, some level, you know, having built something beyond the, the PowerPoint deck or the idea is, uh, is critically important in terms of, you know, how far do you, do you bootstrap it type of thing. Um, you know, there's some markets which effectively are impossible to bootstrap in. Um, they do require some level of, uh, of funding, some level of resources. Um, but in terms of how long do, do you do that? Um, I guess that, that it's, it's, a, it's a how long is that piece of string sort of you know, question. Uh, it's a, it's, it really is a, a mixture of both sides that in order, you need to be able to, to, to essentially identify if we had funding, this is what we're able to, to test, this is what we're able to achieve, this is what we're able to do, and both sides of the deal need to, to, to believe that. Um, and that's really the, the discussion which is actually being, being had. Um, so, you know, if you, if, you know, we like to sort of term that, that ideas are actually worth uh, less than nothing um, because they're actually, you know, people, you know, playing with ideas in some ways uh, is taking away time that could be otherwise spent executing and, and execution is, is really critical. So, you know, we would bias our decisions on what you do with your idea over uh, what, uh, you know, what your idea happens, happens to be because the chances are, um, you know, above none, that it's going to change. Um, that initial idea is going to change. Another question down the front here. And we'll take one more from the right. My, my question is kind of a follow-up to that. You said earlier that this was the first uh, deal that took you out of your comfort zone by investing quite early. So why, what made you comfortable outside of your comfort zone in this case and do you think that's going to continue in the future or that was more of a kind of special case with these guys? Yeah, I guess uh, you know, we, we don't have sort of absolutes around you know, deals that we do or don't do. They're, 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 um, I guess we're, we're, we're quite open-minded in order to, to find the moonshots. Um, but the, you know, why did we do this deal? Um, probably the chemistry of the deal um, in, in terms of looking at it across the, the spectrum of uh, you know, the business idea, the market, the team, the team's experience, the, the orientation of that team's experience to what they were trying to achieve, the chemistry between the, the parties that were in the deal. Um, you know, that, they were the things that gave us the confidence to, to take the first step. And even then, we did so on a, on I guess, you know, a, a staged basis. So hence why we did a number of, you know, I guess, a number of stages. So we, uh, you know, we wanted to prove out that relationship. And, and I guess it, you know, what that also gave was, you know, by tranching the deal as, uh, as, it's, as it's known, we gave the opportunity for both sides to essentially say, you know, on a, you know, you know haven't really risked all that much just yet but time and a little bit of money, we're just going to walk away. Um, so, you know, that's certainly something to think about. And that's why a lot of venture deals are done on a stage basis as, uh, as, as well. Um, and probably taking less money than more, particularly in the early stages, um, is probably a better discipline to have because, you know, if you end up with millions of dollars in the bank, it's sort of like, hang on a second, I've never seen millions of dollars. Um, and then that's generally where you might experience somewhat of a rush of blood to the head, which probably doesn't lead to the... To the best possible outcomes, and look, you know, there's no there's no absolutes, but it's something to think about. And entrepreneurship really thrives when there is conditions of or adverse conditions. And a question over here. It's a kind of related question to the one the gentleman asked uh, before. Um, it's again to Stu. We talked a bit, or well, you guys talked a little bit about the chemistry of the team and um, kind of you guys work together, like co-working co kind of in the same space. What happens if someone from interstate had a team that was based interstate that wanted to come and work with you? How would that affect your, your decision making and your judgments? Um, I guess it's once again, it's uh, the tyranny of distance probably adds complexity to building that relationship, A, in the first place, and then B, the value which can be exchanged between it. So. Um, you know, that said, we've, we've got deals which, uh, and companies which are located in Sydney uh, and also uh, now in Singapore. So, 
Um, it really just depends upon the, the stage of deal that we're involved in. Um, I think proximity in the earliest stages of business is, uh, is, is important, but as it essentially, you know, the business advances and, uh, and the team builds out its own resources to, to support all of its requirements, um, the, the proximity becomes a little less required. Equally, the relationship, if it's solid from that, that early point, um, is going to carry you forward. So, you know, it's like the long, you know, you, you, the friend you, you grew up with in school who happens to now live on the other side of the world, you still have a close and, and quite, uh, I guess, fresh bond with them regardless of both time and distance. We could do questions all night long, but I think we'll just take one more from the very back left-hand side of the, the room over there. Collaboration on that. Um, which... Yeah. So VC hooks. So what are you know, uh, what's Vulture Capital sort of uh, about? Um, uh, venture capital, because there isn't much of it in Australia, uh, probably has got a got a bad name over time, and uh, and sometimes for good reason. Um, but really, I guess uh, you know it, it, it's it, the the hooks are there generally to try and protect the investors' money. Um, a VC manager is a fund manager, they manage somebody else's money. So they're not there because they're you know, the VC manager in some instances, they're there because they're actually trying to, to protect the money. Uh, that said, what they do with those hooks can, and the way in which they apply them is probably more telling about their business style and, uh, and the likes. Uh, fundamentally, venture capital is the most expensive money that you'll find. Um, you know, you're better off you know, trying to find money in other places uh, than venture because essentially it's, it's expensive. They take, you know, you're looking to take material parts of your business and you're also, uh, I guess, accepting a, a long-term relationship. We haven't really touched on it, but I guess, you know, uh, we've been working with One to One Cast now for about 18 months. Um, the general cycle time of a, of a deal is anywhere between sort of, you know, the, the, the shortest ones are probably three years. The longest ones could be 10 or more years. So, you know, this is a long-term play. Um, and as a result, I guess, you know, an investor, you know, in year one is trying to forecast and protect themselves from investors joining in later rounds um, and equally essentially protect the underlying investment that they're, that they're making. So things, the, you know, to be very specific about it are things like preferential uh, shares and the rights associated with those preferential shares and I'm sure you've gone through term sheets to, to an extent with this group and, and Venture Deals is probably a very, very good book um, that I'd recommend that you, you look at. Um, there's also drag along, tag along rights, veto rights. So by veto rights being that uh, the investor actually, uh, despite what may have been decided, can actually change the mind or change the direction of, uh, of the business. Um, and there's you know, any number of other sort of you know, little tricks and, uh, and tips that, uh, that could occur, um, which could see the business in a, in a, bad, uh, in a bad way. So, um, you know, to definitely inform yourself. There's, def there's, there's enormous resources now available online. Um, people like Brad Feld and Fred Wilson and, uh, and the likes are, are definitely good places to go to get crowdsource wisdom um, and to get uh, a very quick and rapid schooling as to, to what's, what's a good deal. Um, and, uh, and essentially, if it doesn't smell right, if it doesn't feel right, Chances are it's not going to get any better with time, but probably going to, to get worse. So also, as an entrepreneur, definitely trust your, uh, your intuition. Um, you know, because if it's a bad deal to start with, it's not going to get better. Right, yeah, we better wrap it up then and there. Thank you very much, Stu and Ed. We've got a couple of bottles of wine for you. Maxine, if you could grab them and bring them out as a token of our appreciation. So please join with me in thanking Stu and Ed. Thank you.